Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to have you all here. I'm Stacy Palmer. I'm editor of the Chronicle of Philanthropy, a news organization that covers the nonprofit world and all of the efforts to advance the common good. I'm excited to kick off the first in a series of discussions about philanthropy that is part of a partnership we have with the Associated Press and The Conversation to help the better public better understand how philanthropy works and what it achieves. Thanks to the Lilly Endowment for providing significant support for this effort and for enabling us to do more discussions like this. We'd love to hear from you about what other conversations we should hold. Um, so please feel free to let us know in the question and answer box what kinds of topics you'd like us to pursue. We're also going to take lots of your questions and answers. So throughout this discussion, please feel free to let us know what's on your mind. Um, and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as we can. This session is being recorded, so you'll have a chance to listen to it all again. Um, and we'll be sending that out as soon as we can. Today, we're assessing how philanthropy responded as the nation faced multiple crises. The death of George Floyd, the pandemic, threats to democracy, so many things that triggered a flood of charitable donations and, act, and a wave of activism to groups focused on promoting racial equity. That area covers a wide, wide range of giving. Donors sent money to groups like Black Lives Matter, the NAACP, Color of Change, and many other racial equity groups, but also to many other efforts. Historically, Black colleges received many donations. Art museums received money to be able to help ensure that their narratives were more expansive and inclusive. Efforts like housing received a boost. So we've seen a wide range of donations, and we've seen many other things take off. Just in the past few weeks, the Asian American Foundation announced that it had raised a billion dollars um, to be able to work on efforts um, that focus on Asian Americans. So really a wave of activity. Just to give you a sense of the numbers and how amazing they are, the early estimates are that at least $11 billion flowed in over the past year. In the past 10 years, we've only seen $9 billion come in. So an outrageous amount of giving. But now the question is, what is it doing? How does it make a difference? Um, and what do we need to do next? And so that's what we're going to talk about today with our panelists. I'm going to let them introduce themselves um, so they can tell you a little bit about who they are. And Anna, I'm going to start with you. Terrific. Well, thank you, Stacy. Um, I'm really honored to be here with you. It's an honor to be here with Earl and with Daniel. Um, so, and in this important conversation, it's great that we're kicking it off. Um, Hispanics in Philanthropy, affectionately known as HIP, is the largest um, impact catalyst working across the Americas. Uh, we like to say that we're driving resources to the Latinx global community. We're strengthening power, participation, relationships, leadership. Um, simply put, I describe us as an international network. In Spanish, you would say a collective corazón, a collective heart of different types of funders, individuals, corporate, foundation, impact investors, and we do lots of convening, connecting, informing advocacy. So that's one leg of what we do. The other part of our work is as an intermediary. I sit on the board of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, so we're similar to them. And our work as an intermediary means that we're the go-to resource for charities, foundations, philanthropists, impact investors, and even actually the public sector um, when they're looking to invest in the Latinx community and they wanna have a long lasting impact. So we don't tend to do one-offs, we tend to do work that um, really evolves over time. We have staff all across the US in the Caribbean and also in Latin America. We have about 12, 13 staff in Mexico City that are working on Central America, Venezuela, Colombia. So our work as an intermediary takes the shape of crowdfunding, grant making, and lots and lots and lots of capacity building. Uh, right now, our funds are addressing essential workers, migration, the borders, small businesses, women and girls, uh, whenever there is an 
earthquake or a hurricane, uh, we tend to be there too. So for example, we've been in Puerto Rico a lot over the past three years. And um, that's how long I've been the CEO. And it's just been such an honor and a privilege to do this work that over the past three years, every single day is different. Um, it has been, hopefully we'll get a little bit more flatness <laughs> going forward, <laughs> but um, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Wonderful. Earl? Hi there, and thanks, Stacy. And it's a pleasure indeed to be part of this conversation. These days, I'm the Thomas C. Holt Distinguished University Professor of History, Afro-American and African Studies and Public Policy, as well as the founding director of the Center for Social Solutions at the University of Michigan. I moved back to Michigan in 2018, so it's a little over three years now, uh, and the center works in four areas. Uh, the first dealing with diversity and democracy. Another area is slavery and its aftermath. A uh, third area is water and security. And the fourth area uh, deals with the dignity of labor in an automated world. And as part of this effort, we span a lot of uh, projects, uh, including uh, really steering a conversation about reparations in the United States. Um, post the events of last spring and summer. And so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a few minutes, but um, that's our scope. And um, it's been fun to be back in where I no longer give away money uh, as I, I did when I was president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And now I get to be on the other side of the table uh, trying to find and beg for money, uh, but to, to use it uh, to actually come up with uh, tangible solutions uh, in real time. Great. Daniel? Well, really glad to be here. And it's and really uh, wanted to, to offer kudos to the Chronicle, the Associated Press, and the conversation for banding together and having a conversation like this. It's an honor to be flanked by Earl and Anna Marie. Um, I'm, uh, I'm actually in, in, in the beginning part of a sabbatical right now and haven't put two or three sentences together in some time. So I know if I trip over my shoelaces, um, we're gonna be in, 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 in fine hands with Earl and Anna Marie. Um, until two months ago, I served um, at the Levi Strauss Foundation um, and including 12 years as the executive director. And that's a global foundation that operated in about 40 countries um, in three areas, the rights and the well-being of, of apparel workers, um, the fight against HIV and AIDS and social justice. Um, I also serve on the board of the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy. And that's a, an organization that um, is willing to, to, you know, to be critical about philanthropy. It also um, serves as a space um, where it takes the best thinking of the nonprofit sector and brings that to bear to inform better practices for philanthropy. So I sit on that board with movement leaders as well as leaders in philanthropy, and that keeps it really real. Um, also on the board um, of, of the Open Society Foundation's um, public health programs. Right. Wonderful. Earl, I, you mentioned um, that you've been on both sides of the table. So I'm going to start with you because that helps really sort of illustrate for us what it's like to be both on the giving and the receiving side of these dollars. Um, you're working on a project that's really fascinating. I'd love you to dig into it and explain what it is you're doing and why philanthropy is such an important piece of the work that you're doing. Uh, thank you for that question. So last summer, uh, coming, as you noted, with the confluence of the sort of three streams, uh, both uh, COVID, uh, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, among others, uh, and then uh, massive unemployment uh, that all came, we were sort of faced with a question of what would constitute, constitute a just future. And so the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which I had been president of uh, for five years, sent out a call for a proposal and, and, and all and our center actually responded by saying, if we're gonna talk about just futures over this next period, uh, perhaps we should actually turn to the question that has been on and off the American uh, social table uh, for well over 100, 150 years. And that's the question of reparations. And reparations can be thought of as actually compensating three different time periods. There's certainly the question of reparations to those who were descendants of American slaves uh, and that period of slavery and its aftermath. But there's also questions about reparations in Jim Crow and this period that came in the late 19th uh, through the middle of the 20th century uh, when there was systematic discrimination. We um, 
highlighted the Tulsa massacre in many in different venues the last uh, couple of weeks, um, but we realized that Tulsa was only one of many sites uh, where there were such massacres. Uh, Wilmington, North Carolina in uh, 1898 uh, would be another one that I could highlight. But third, we realized that the timeline actually didn't stop in the 1950s and 1960s, that indeed uh, the period of mass incarceration uh, and is really deleterious effects on uh, black and brown communities in the United States needs to be thought of as a period uh, that also should focus on repair. So we ended up writing this grant and, and receiving it. And so we using colleges and universities as anchors, uh, institutions and communities uh, from Minnesota on the Western Northern edge and Minnesota, North Dakota, uh, so Moorhead, Minnesota and Fargo, North Dakota with Concordia College being the institution there and dealing with the Ojibwe people uh, coming up and down the Red River Valley uh, and, and what that sort of constitutes there for a story about reparations. Uh, Michigan, where the University of Michigan is the institution and where we have three nodes, uh, Flint, uh, Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti and uh, Detroit and Dearborn, the three nodes there. Then we move uh, east uh, to Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University as the anchor institution. Uh, as we, and Pittsburgh is greater Pittsburgh and uh, that part of Western uh, Pennsylvania. And then uh, we go uh, to Connecticut College in New London, uh, Connecticut uh, as the next in this sort of lineup. And then as we go down the Eastern seaboard, we find our way to uh, Newark and Rutgers Newark. Uh, and then we jump a good part of the Mid-Atlantic until we get to South Carolina. Uh, and Wofford College uh, in Spartanburg, South Carolina then uh, joins this lineup uh, aided uh, by um, Wesleyan College, the first all women's college in the United States in Macon, Georgia. And then uh, we settled in Atlanta and two versions of Atlanta. And there's Emory University and that used to be uh, one of my employers. Uh, and then uh, there's Spelman uh, College, uh, historically a black college and university uh, for, for women. Uh, and in each of those locations, the questions of reparations uh, takes on a different kind of cast. And what we wanted to do was to say, this is not something that academics bring to communities uh, and define uh, what are reparations, that this will only work if communities are themselves involved in defining what kinds of reparations. And I was reminded, I was telling someone yesterday that sometimes in the academy, uh, we fail to realize that a lot of community folks are intellectual workers. Uh, and what we need to figure out as a way is to validate uh, and to highlight the intellectual work that they are doing. So over the next three years, we're working in these different locations to begin to sort of highlight uh, from the community perspective in partnership with colleges and universities, what are the racial reparation narratives uh, that uh, should be surfaced and how do we then go from surfacing those narratives to coming up with tangible solutions and that can be used to educate policymakers uh, in those uh, particular uh, areas of the country. And I, I use the word educate because I've been reminded by my colleagues in, in philanthropy, I cannot lobby, but I can educate. And, and so I said, we're gonna educate the heck out of this. Uh, and so, uh, and, and that's key. But we also has another partner in this is actually WQED, the media conglomerate out of Pittsburgh and public media channel, because they're going to help us to actually produce a documentary on the backside of this and that begins to explain to a national audience, what do we mean by reparations? What do they look like? How do they vary by community? Why is it important at this point coming out of the summer of 2020 into 2021? that we're dealing with racial reparations in the United States. Uh, and as we can anticipate, and we already know, uh, there's gonna be uh, some blowback and, and there are gonna be uh, folks who are gonna question the whole legitimacy of this enterprise. We anticipate that, we welcome it, uh, and uh, we look forward to trying to transform the narrative. And I'll end with this point. Uh, African-American peoples began to talk about reparations right after the end of the Civil War. Uh, and so we have been engaged in a conversation about reparations since 1865, if not before. In fact, African-Americans actually introduced the idea of reparations even uh, when the country was being formed in the 1770s. We have actually had chapters of reparations, 
Native Alaskans, uh, when Alaska became part of the United States, uh, received 16 million acres of uh, a six on, sorry 44 million acres 16 percent of the land mass of Alaska was part of the agreement uh, and close to a billion dollars to create 12 corporate uh, corporations in Alaska there was a way in which reparations were put on the table in that particular uh, setting uh, and then of course we get to 1988 uh, and Civil Liberties Act uh, and our attempt to uh, bring some redress with respect to Japanese Americans. And so uh, globally reparations is a topic and we have many examples, but even in the United States, uh, we have examples. Uh, and so we're building on that. Yes, uh, we're all gonna be watching this very, very closely. And it is a fascinating way, especially of getting colleges to work with their communities in ways that we don't often see. Um, many of you may wanna know a little bit more about Earl's project. Um, and Glenn Gamboa of the Associated Press, who's part of this partnership, wrote a wonderful story last week um, that we'll post a link to so that you can find out more. Anna Maria, I'm gonna to turn to you next because Hispanics and philanthropy, as you describe the organization, you see a little bit of absolutely everything in philanthropy. You do crowdfunding and sort of the kind of work that comes from everyday donors. Um, you were the recipient of an amazing gift from Mackenzie Scott for $15 million. Um, some of you may know she has given eight billion dollars um, over the past 18 months or so, which is remarkable. We haven't seen a living donor do anything like that um, and really surprise a lot of organizations. So I'm curious from your perspective, what are the things that you're seeing as the key trends in how Hispanics are responding to the racial reckoning? Um, thank you. In my opinion, the real champions that are responding, the champions of philanthropy have been our abuelas, our tias, our neighbors. They've been giving so generously of their money and their time supporting one another. Um, and unfortunately, you know, as you know, given that you're at the Chronicle of Philanthropy, you know that Latinx philanthropy is vastly understudied. Uh, we know that Latinos are very, very generous, but our philanthropy, since it looks so different, it's much more relational, less institutional, it's less formalized. Um, and so it, what we know is limited. The exciting news is that we're partnering with the Lilly School of Philanthropy. And by you know this fall at our conference in September, we're gonna have a lot more research that's gonna help us understand the face of our donors um, mm. and what they look like. Um, it looks like remittances to family, it's church giving to churches, giving to organizational, um, to different community organizations. It tends to also be to education and to uh, entrepreneurs, given that so many of our folks have bootstrapped their way. Um, they understand the value of education and small businesses. Um, last year though, in specific, specifically, it was really affirming to see how Hispanics and actually all donors respond, responded. Uh, we saw a significant rise in donations and in resources to propel um, our racial justice work and a lot of the funds that we are, are, are holding right now. A welcome side effect was also how everyday givers stepped up. And uh, as an example, our uh, crowdfunding site, it's a free bilingual crowdfunding site called Hip Give. Um, which we've had it for about five years. Last year, we saw a 30% increase over the year before. So we had almost 20,000 givers and between them, they raised about one and a quarter million dollars in 2020. So that was 30%. And so that's pretty impressive because you're, you know, th these are folks that are giving 25 and $50. And many of them, once they start in crowdfunding, they become recurring. And that's, that's really great. And I think that what we saw at HIP was mirrored uh, with other nonprofit organizations and other similar organizations. In terms of trends, uh, we saw, as you mentioned, high net worth stepping it up. Mackenzie Scott received most of the media attention, but there were many, many others, both inside the Latino community and outside. And if you talk to folks uh, who manage donor advised funds, the DAFs, uh, they will tell you the same. Uh, many donors who were holding their accounts for something in the future, but they understood the urgency of the moment and they made much larger disbursements. And many of them also um, started thinking about the general operating support, which is so important and so critical so that organizations can actually do the work, the pipes that we need so that we can do the work. 
when we think about what motiv motivated givers, I think a lot of the new donors gave because for the first time, the very invisible inequities became visible. They were confronted by the pandemic and people, many of us had the luxury of working from home literally in our bubbles, right? And so that was very much juxtaposed to the farm workers and all of the essential workers that were making our lives possible. And I would venture to say there was maybe a little bit of guilt involved in what happened last year. And how do we translate that into long-term future giving that is looking at systems change and at the racial inequities? Um, you also asked me to address Latinidad, the meaning of Latinidad, Latinness, and um, how Latinos are giving. And um, that's a little bit complicated because there's a part of the Latinx community that has during the last year taken on an us versus them attitude. They've seen all of the attention on the black community, the Asian community. And if I'm honest, I'm gonna say they're thinking about what about us? And they're feeling like Latinos maybe are overlooked, but that's not accurate. And at HIP we're doing a lot of work around colorism and really lifting up how even though we have different origin stories, we speak different versions of Spanish, we look very different, um, understanding that we are all in this work together and uh, understanding the legacy of colonialism and the legacy of col colorism and recognizing how it had influenced who gets a seat at the table. I mean, those of you ha that have seen In the Heights, who gets to, to be portrayed in movies, and that really trickles down to who gets funding and who, who we consider uh, um, as really the rightful leaders of the community. And so this is something that we're working really hard to address uh, this um, anti-blackness that exists not just in you know, white communities, but it exists in the Latino community. And there's donors that understand that our communities are inextricably linked, in, I can't say that word, inextricably linked. Um, and we're for, at HIP we were doing uh, a really cool project that's called Together We Win, which was really uh, bringing together black and brown businesses so that we would buy black and brown. It sounds complex, but um, the key I think is to listen, to listen deeply and to work with trusted partners that are led by the community and serving the community. One is not the other, you need to have both. And I think what you just mentioned is interesting too. What, some of the money that you're using from Mackenzie Scott and my right is some of it to invest, help businesses get started because it's very hard for entrepreneurs to get the funds that they need. Could you talk a little bit about that? Oh, happy to. It's just, it's a, the whole ecosystem is messed up. Um, the federal government doesn't invest in our community. Uh, uh, banks don't invest in our community. I think that in terms of, well, this last round of the PPP loans were a lot better, but in that first round when everybody was really suffering, uh, only 9% of, of BIPOC um, businesses were able to access those loans. So our, our, our businesses were left to really falter. And it had taken us a full 10 years to recover from 2008, 2009. We were, you know, the community was finally starting to make up some of that wealth that was lost in the Great Recession. And now it's been erased. Um, it's gonna take, some are saying, estimating 2050 is when we're gonna recover what was just lost. Mm. Um, and so yes, at HIP, even though we've always been doing, well, for the past 20 years, we've been doing grant making, nonprofits. When COVID started, we realized that we needed to start making cash assistance to businesses as well, because how are we gonna have donors if our all of our wealth has been stripped? So we wanted to keep as many businesses as possible up and alive. Um, so that was our power up fund. And we did about $3 million in cash assistance to small businesses. And now that's being, we're pivoting and we're now doing impact investing. We're doing equity investments and Latino entrepreneurs because you know there's also very few fund managers are people of color. And so if you don't have fund managers that are people of color, that trickles down. We don't have investments that are going into entrepreneurs. So it's the whole ecosystem has to be looked at is what we um, have realized. It's really important. Thank you for all that. 
Um, before I turn to Daniel, let me just remind you all that we'd be happy to take your questions. So please go ahead and put them uh, in the box and we'll answer them. Um, Daniel, you, you, know, when you just stepped down from Levi Strauss, a company that's very well known for supporting social justice. And one of the things that was really striking about the response to the protests and everything else was that companies just gave very fast um, and were among the leaders, I think, at least at this moment, it looks like J.P. Morgan Chase is the biggest giver, bigger than Ford, Kellogg, all of the others, that it was companies that really sort of gave some of the most significant support. I was wondering if you could put that into context for us. What are some of the kinds of organizations that companies are supporting and how, is, how are they thinking about changing the way that they respond to social justice issues? Okay. Well, Stacey, we're indeed living through one of the most disruptive five-year spots of history. And when it comes to the corporate response to this moment, it's certainly been a space that's interlaced with disruption, some promise, a surge in statements and activity, and I must say, a good deal of head scratching. Um, the tectonic plates are really shifting, and the, the big news um, is that the nexus between business and politics um, which was, you know, which was used to be sacrosanct is, is really seeing a fundamental shift. Um, politics prior to five years ago used to be a third rail, something to be avoided at all costs in the CSR sector. But now we're seeing it's an inescapable part of the business conversation. And it's spilling over from the public sector in the face of gridlock, in the face of inaction, and, and sometimes in the, in the case of, of outrage over repressive policy initiatives. Um, Four years ago, if you recall, we witnessed the dominoes falling in the face of the response to the Muslim and Africa travel ban, um, in the rescinding of DACA, um, the prior administration's handling and creation, if you will, of the southern border crisis, um, and the efforts by the prior administration to define transgender people out of existence. Um, many companies put their, their voice, their influence on the line, and we're now seeing a small swath of co companies that are leading the charge on unaddressed social issues. And the, the swath of areas where, they, where this falls tends to be in, in sustainability, particularly with the Paris Accords, equality, uh, immigration, gun safety, and voting rights. Um, and some companies, and I wanna highlight these, have gone even further to pair their voice in advocacy with making investments in mov movers and shakers in the community that are leading these issues in civil society. Um, these include Ben and & Jerry's and Lush. And those two companies have amazing websites where they've created a conversation with their consumers in a very courageous way. Tom's around gun safety, uh, Patagonia, um, Salesforce, um, Levi Strauss and Google.org in particular. Um, so let's fast forward to 2020. You said in your inter introductory remarks that $12 million or so in cash contributions were earmarked for racial justice. The staggering news from candid data is that 8.2 billion of this total, and that's 68%, hails from the corporate sector. And for context, what makes, why is this, what, what's the so what? In a given year, less than 5% of all giving comes from the corporate sector. Um, and foundation giving usually outpaces um, the, the business sector's giving by a factor of three to one. Um, it's also fascinating to see that in a given year, um, NCRP has done a, a study of what percentage of the corporate sector's giving has gone to social justice causes. And in a 15 year sample, the average is around 3.2%. And that includes racial justice. So this is, this is some, some major changes that are happening. As you mentioned, JP Morgan Chase is the largest investor there. And if we, if we add on business investments and here think um, loans for home ownership as well as, as, as businesses, um, that, that amount from the corporate sector um, balloons to 50 million, sorry, $50 billion towards racial equity. So um, I, I love the marketplace um, uh, podcast and I'm gonna do glass half full and glass half empty here. Um, the glass half full is that, you know, the, the, from this space of insulation where, where, where politics wasn't touched, two thirds of all S&P 500 companies have made public statements about Black Lives Matter. We can, we can evaluate those in a number of ways. And 36% of S&P 500 companies have pledged to, to promote racial equity through their donations. And there's no doubt these amounts are exponentially, exponentially larger. Um, now to the other part, glass half empty. Um, of the 50 billion in cash gifts and business investments committed by the corporate sector in 2020, 
uh, less than 250 million has actually been spent or committed. And that's actually, uh, this is the data from a group called Creative Investment Research. Um, and the bad rap that corporate philanthropy has is that um, it's a lot of talk and not a lot of actions. And for a sector that prides itself on a bias towards action and swift, um, swift execution, the allocation of what half of 1% is a real head scratcher to be, to be kind. Um, and I would submit when we look at the, the surge of, of donations that happened immediately following last summer's protests, um, I would submit that the corporate response to Black Lives Matter has in many ways mirrored the norms of disaster relief funding. And here I mean one and done grants that are generally given two or three days, you know, plastered on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the websites um, of, 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 of grants. And there was radio silence after that for the most part. And when we, when we think about the beneficiaries, there's a small swath, small swath of national organizations. Um, the NAACP, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Equal Justice Initiative, um, the Black Lives Matter organization, and the ACLU, you've got, these have gotten sizable infusions from companies like PayPal, Salesforce, Home Depot, Nordstrom, and Nike. Um, but this is very reminiscent of the funding flows that happened right after the 2016 election, which saw the, the, the election of Donald Trump, where only four organizations received surges in individual donations. At that time, if you recall, it was the ACLU, Move On, uh, Planned Parenthood, and the Sierra Club. But in, in both cases, the beneficiaries were national organizations with brands that were built over decades. And this didn't translate into um, just similar gains. So the question that I'm sitting with, you know, we, we, we sort of sip tea from the fire hose is how can the business sector pivot from sort of this just disaster relief one and done, a surge of statements and one-off grants to a strategic, a structural and a sustained approach? Um, and that's the big question I think for the future. And I've, I have a big bag of popcorn. <laughs> it is a big one. And I'm curious because one of the things we're trying to do is think about the ways that the public can get involved. You don't necessarily always have to be a philanthropist to make change um, and that you don't even necessarily, it's not always about giving money. What difference do employees make, especially these days, in influencing what the companies they work for, how they're thinking about the statements, the dollars that they give, that kind of thing? Can you talk a bit about that? It's, this is a, a moment where we have a workforce that um, I think the, 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 the data shows that around 69% of Gen Y and Gen Z, they expect companies should engage with Black Lives Matter. And the, you know, the, the, the tide has moved to the direction where, where this, this new generation entering the workforce believes that companies should stand for more, not just for their shareholders, but have an impact on the world. Um, at Levi Strauss and Company, it was certainly the case that we saw a surge in, in, in concern about the communities that we care about. Um, and a, a lot of awareness since we've been living the, the world through our screens here and seeing the world, you know, um, I think we see employees calling on their, on their, their companies to do more, to be more. Um, and it's not just what you, what you stand for, but what you stand up for. Um, and it's been a really dynamic time the last four years in particular in, in the face of disruption. We've seen, we've, we've seeded um, over 30, uh, 30 sessions between our grantees and our employees. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also been a time where I think with, you know, with Levi Strauss being an American icon and our recognition that what we say about America matters, we really, you know, took stands for democracy in two ways. Number one, protection of the weak and vulnerable with a $7 million rapid response fund supporting groups in the crosshairs of the administration's policies. And number two, um, we invested $3 million in BIPOC communities, um, 20 organizations, 15 led by women of color to ensure that all voices, especially BIPOC people and, and especially women of color are put at the center of democracy. Um, I think it's also a moment that, that brands with, with access to um, not just capital, but also the influential platforms and vast brand audiences um, leverage these. And, Levi's had, Levi's had a series on its Instagram live account called Use Your Voice Live. And we were really um, honored to curate a series of our, of, of our grantees um, talking about the importance of, 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 um, of every voice being heard. People like Alicia Garza and Ai-jen Poo, people like Latasha Brown from Black Voters Matter, um, folks um, like Amy Allison from, um, from She the People. Um, we believe that it's really critical that um, 
this no longer be this insulated insulated space where politics is is not seen as is is seen as taboo. We know that companies have weighed in in very non-transparent ways, such as lobbying. <laughs> it, it, the expectation is um, that that they that we use our voice, we use our influence um, to make the world a better place. And and stand, and I think the next frontier, and I'd love to see it, is standing with funding and, and, and engaging with the people who are the movers and shakers of these issues in civil society. And I'm glad you mentioned Black Voters Matter. One of the stories in the series that we've published together with Associated Press featured that organization. Um, and Hallelujah Hadero did an excellent look at all of the money that's flowing in and you know, talking about the way that, you know, I think they had 90,000 contributions or something like that lots of small dollars added up to really big impact. So it truly can make such a difference. Earl, I know one of the things you're looking at in your project is corporate giving as well. Is there anything you wanted to add in to give the perspective of what's going on and how we'll even know and hold companies accountable? Yeah, so one of the tangible byproducts of our work is we're trying to come up with and develop what we are referring to as a reparations, accountability, and responsibility index, uh, and where we take the uh, broad claims and, and the work that Daniel so nicely illustrated, uh, and not only track it uh, for one quarter or two or three or four, but actually uh, set up a structure where we're actually looking at this over a period of time. If you fast, uh, well, not fast forward, but uh, go backward uh, three or four uh, decades, you can remember uh, something that seems so quaint now called Operation Push and Jesse Jackson and his attempt uh, to hold uh, corporate America uh, responsible and accountable. I mean, part of that was getting uh, more, in that case, Blacks uh, on uh, corporate boards, but also uh, for investing in, buying in, supporting uh, Black run and own businesses and all. And I realized for a lot of us uh, in last summer, um, it had a feeling of deja vu. That is, uh, there are a series of crises that always erupt on some kind of schedule and would lead uh, people to respond um, because it was the right thing to do, be it either because of uh, pushing uh, from their employees or because of some general sense that this was important. And so what we're trying to do is actually uh, take all those people at their word, uh, see what they uh, have said. We have 14 uh, categories or so, uh, so far in the index that we're looking at. We're loading these data. We've been helped by Candid actually, and, and, and Brad Smith and his colleagues have actually provided us with some data that they have uh, as we uh, then tease this out. And then we will stick with it. We will actually issue essentially our own version of a responsibility report card uh, at uh, some point later this uh, summer in, into the early uh, fall, uh, and then we'll update it. And so, uh, there, as we refer to it in, inside of our operation, they're the people above the line. That is, they actually have said something, done something, and they should actually be uh, touted for what they've done. And then there's scores of others who are below the line. They haven't said a word uh, of haven't done anything that is visible. Uh, and so we want to praise and even as we uh, analyze, perhaps critically analyze those who are above the line, but we want to note those below the line uh, who also have uh, some opportunity here uh, to become uh, change makers. But uh, to Anna Marie and Daniel point, what we're also mindful of is that we want to begin to figure out a way how to identify and isolate individuals who are making community, making uh, improvements in their own communities uh, who aren't necessarily part of well-heeled or well-positioned uh, corporations. And, and, and I'll illustrate it with two quick examples. I was on a phone call this morning uh, with my friend Dwight Andrews, who's a senior, among many things, is a senior pastor of First Congregational Church uh, in Atlanta. And, and Dwight is trying to figure out this church had the boys uh, in attendance uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, Andy Young was the senior pastor uh, at a point in the 1960s. But the question that Dwight and I were talking about, how do you position this church? Uh, as a center of repair for the community looking forward. How do you begin to actually use its tangible and physical assets uh, to uh, sort of think of its role uh, in Atlanta uh, and, and as a employment hub, as a tech hub, 
uh, as a biomedical uh, site, uh, as a, a site where people are learning skills. That's a whole different kind of model uh, of thinking through than that kind of philanthropy. And this is philanthropy from within the community where the church itself becomes a philanthropic institution by giving back to the community uh, in a different way uh, from just people typing and, and giving some percent uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. Uh, and that has a corporate model to it and the corporate structure is a different way. And this is interesting and they're in the process of developing all of this, but I was uh, it, it actually in, emboldened by uh, some of the things that uh, Dwight had to say. And another one, I actually will uh, claim this is, I know deeply and personally because it's actually my own brother who, who's, and sister-in-law who started this, but they live in Fort Wayne, Indiana and using their own resources uh, and, and deciding to be philanthropic bought a building uh, in Fort Wayne uh, and are rehabbing this building uh, not too far from a church that they're uh, connected to, but with the goal of actually creating a new educational technology center uh, in the heart of the Black community uh, in Fort Wayne uh, and where they're using their own resources in which they will then try to marry with other resources uh, to become a place uh, where young people can actually position themselves for a future uh, where they actually uh, can believe that all things are possible. And these are the examples that sort of two, one an institution like a venerable black church, another one, two individuals uh, who come out of corporate America, my brother is a, a vice president at Raytheon, um, but who sort of uses this to actually move on. Those models are getting replicated elsewhere all over the country. And, uh, and as we look at the corporate sphere uh, and not zero in on these smaller places. I mean, uh, to Daniel's earlier point, I mean, my worry coming out of last summer is, is that some of my good friends who have done extraordinary work uh, in building organizations and institutions were the recipients uh, of a lot of largesse because they were visible and had been around. But there are hundreds of others who are in the throes of producing something that will be critically important uh, for the future of this nation, uh, and in some ways uh, for the survivability of our democracy. I'm so glad you underscored that because much as obviously we value all of the work that some of these large organizations are doing, it's some of these other efforts that are innovating and serving their communities in ways that make a tremendous difference. And so we all need to you know, watch them um, and hope that more of them spread. We are starting to get some questions. And so I wanna be able to move to a few of those now. Um, the first question is for you, Earl. Can reparations at scale be truly successful without truth telling and sharing? The, the short answer is no. <laughs> and so, I mean, and, and we have to find a way to actually um, not run away from our history. I mean, so I'm a historian by training, and I find this last few months one of the most uh, damning moments uh, in American life where we have, what is it, 23 states right now who are claiming they're going to run away from something called critical race theory, although at least by the things that I've heard, they don't really understand what that is. It came out of the legal uh, community uh, and Kim Crenshaw and others uh, sort of extended it. It's been around for 30 years and it's all of a sudden uh, last summer somebody got some talking points uh, and ended up deciding that these are the talking points to latch on to. Uh, and so, no, we have to actually deal with um, truth. Uh, and, and there are several different models uh, that are being approached. So Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen, who in their new book on reparations, have what they refer to as the ARC uh, model, where there is acknowledgement and then uh, some attempt uh, at restitution and recovery uh, followed by closure. Uh, that's one model. Um, Aria Florenta and her uh, colleagues at uh, venture uh, liberations, uh, liberation ventures rather, uh, have a different sort of model of sort of racial reckoning uh, as a model. I think and, and totally believe that uh, if our project is at all successful, we may not have a TRC equivalent to South Africa or even the one that we found among uh, First Nation peoples um, and dealing with the boarding schools and other situations in Canada. <clears throat> but we will find ourselves having uh, to come up with and come to some reconciliation over what we know and how we know it and why we know it. Uh, and 
that in and of itself will be uh, all together important. And, 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 and it may be, just may be. I, mean, I, I taught, uh, I jokingly said, I taught undergraduates this past fall uh, more than two uh, for the first time uh, in 25 years. The last time I had that many undergraduates in the class, I taught these kids parents and that's literally true. Uh, and, uh, but I was sitting there and the first day of class, I said, so why are you taking this class and what you, do you want to learn? And they said, I'm taking this class because I know there were things I was not taught in high school and there are things that I wanna make sure when I leave a college that I can say to myself and to my friends and to my family and my children that I learned things and that I was not taught in high school. So there is an earnestness on the part of many who want to know more. And I think part of dealing with some version of truth and reconciliation uh, will get us closer uh, to filling in those big gaps that exist uh, across the nation about what has happened, uh, how it happened, why it happened, and to whom it happened. Um, the next question is one we discussed quite a bit um, when we were preparing for this panel, so I'm very glad to see it. Um, many grant makers have funding reporting criteria that makes it nearly impossible for smaller, often minority or woman-run nonprofits to meet. What are your thoughts on the ways to make the grant process less stringent or cumbersome to under-resourced or less savvy nonprofits? Do you think we can move from grants to gifts with fewer strings attached? I mean, I know all of you have thoughts on that topic. Um, Anna, can I start with you? <gasps> Me? Yeah, I mean, we saw it done this year. Uh, so many of the grants that we had that were project support, very specific, um, were then turned into general operating. So if we could do it last year, why don't we just keep that trend going forward? Um, there's plenty of research that shows that a healthy organization actually needs 20% of each grant to go into that dirty word indirect. But that dirty word is what allowed us last year to take all of our plans for like 2020, throw them away and start. It allows us to be nimble and to be flexible. And that general operating support then puts the people affected um, and in the driver's seat. They know best. And so let them decide how the monies can be used and it allows them to respond. So it's just continuing to do that. I know that a lot of folks feel like they wanna see the results of a project, but think instead about investing in great ideas, great institution, great individuals, instead of project. If you think bigger, uh, they will get to their results. Some of you may know um, the Dan Pallotta, who's an activist on the subject, often wears a t-shirt that says, I am overhead, to remind people that it's the people who carry out the work um, and that that's a very important thing to fund. Um, I had some people last year that wanted to invest, like, I want to give you $100,000, but every single penny needs to go to the <laughs> essential workers or to the people that are affected. Um, my staff are affected too. We, you know, you know, we're essential both, workers. We're, well, we're protagonists <laughs> in the in, in in the same work, and so that that you just need to understand that we need the pipes and the infrastructure to do the work. Indeed, um, I'm going to go quickly to make sure. Daniel, did you want to say something? Yeah. I'm going to go to the next yeah. question. Everyone is talking about the Mackenzie Scott gifts, and yes. I think for me, my takeaway is that the, this tranche of grants refashioning and redefining what a big bet means. There's a study in, um, that was created by Open Impact, Heather McLeod Grant and Alexa Caldwell. They looked at big bets of $10 million or more over a, a period, and most of them went to hospitals, universities, and elite arts institutions. 43% went to Ivy League grads, 11% to, to organizations led by people of color. Mm. So what's sexy, I believe, is taking an organization with a great idea and a great leader and asking them what they need. And by in, in, at Levi Strauss, by bringing leaders to, to the board meetings every, every chance that we could, it brought people who sat on boards from the corporate sector or family shareholders into the headset of what is it like to, to, to lead a movement? What is it like to run an organization? What is it like to do change management? And we often found that people were doing three jobs, that of an HR head, a communications head, fundraising head, having to fill out a report. So this fundamental, um, thing of not just saying nonprofits, they're inefficient, 
there's, there's been this great distrust of the sector. What I hope that Mackenzie Scott paves the way for more people saying, what do you need? And fortifying organizations with generous support, please. Stacy, you guys covered, and I know that there was a New York Times front page article um, last spring, uh, an article, it was something like, in philanthropy, race is still a factor in terms of who gets what. And it was an organic study that um, was followed by Echo and Green who invest mm -hmm. in fellows. Um, and they had like 20 years of data to show that all from all of their fellows, um, which are picked according to the same criteria and go through the same exact curriculum, those that were white and were leading white organizations were vastly overfunded than those that were uh, people yeah, I think there was a 20% difference. Um, Huge. The and same so, kind of work, the same kind of thing. And exactly. yet, found it, so it's, it's, I mean, it's good to have these studies that show us what is truly happening. Mm -hmm. Earl, I know you mentioned when we were talking um, a case where you were at Mellon, and you overheard a grantee trying to return a grant because of those restrictions. Could you tell us that for a sec? Yeah, so uh, in those days, um, staff used to sit outside of offices. And so I was happened to have my door partly ajar and I could hear one of the staff from our arts and cultural heritage uh, on the phone. Uh, and I'm like, okay, I probably shouldn't be eavesdropping, but I can't help but hearing this. And where um, there was a grantee who was saying, our paperwork was so onerous. Uh, she was a one or two person operation that uh, rather than continuing that she was gonna send the money back. And, and I got up and walked away from my desk and I came around, I said, uh, Sunita, did I just hear, I, I, it wasn't meaning to eavesdrop, but I couldn't help but overhearing, is this a grantee who's gonna send the money back to us? And she said, yeah, and then she filled in the detail and I thought, you know, there's a problem. Uh, if this is an organization that, given how stringent our um, examinations were for even getting to that point of being offered a grant, but then the backside of it is, I mean, to Emory's notion about overhead, there's a second overhead. Because what she was saying is there was the initial overhead to get the grant, then there's a second overhead to actually maintain the grant and report on it and, and all that um, this at least uh, potential one-time grantee was saying it was too burdensome. Uh, and that caused us to figure out and have to ask questions. What are we doing? I mean, if our goal is to give money to support ideas and people as my colleagues were suggesting, and then we make it so burdensome for them on the other side, uh, are we actually doing our jobs? Uh, and, and I know that raised real hard questions for us and, and an internal mm -hmm. debate. I mean, because uh, there, you know, it, it was a debate, uh, as I would say about Mellon in, in those days, uh, it was a venerable institution. Uh, and, and so there were traditions that had been born and developed over a, a few decades. And so. Uh, and, and quite the discussion this moment. I'm going to go fast again, um, because we are starting to run out of time. There's a question for Daniel. What do you think the driver of the change in corporate perspectives about raising their voices for formerly third rail issues such as social justice and voting rights? Is it pressure from employees or customers or some other driver? What's behind it? I think all, all of the above. Um, I think we're in a space where sitting, sitting, sitting this out and the idea that you can sit it out is becoming more and more untenable. I think if we look back at the recent um, response to the, the Georgia um, the Georgia law that restricted a lot of voting rights, which, which clearly targets folks of color. It was just, it was fascinating that, that so many consumers were looking to um, Georgia homegrown companies like, um, like Delta Airlines, like Home Depot um, to, to take a stand. And um, you know, many of them just said, we're, we're not gonna take a stand here. And that, is, that silence is glaring. Um, and uh, you know, it was great to see groups like Major League Baseball put their business presence on the line and move the all-star game. But um, I think folks were realizing that those same companies were giving money to their lobbying to the very legislators who are coming up with these initiatives. So I think this, this idea of a moral compass and the business sector needing to be part of it is something that's really rising to the fore right now. And I think it's something that millennials in particular, um, Gen Z are demanding and calling for um, and we're in a place where we've been sitting and staring at our screens. So we're demanding more of the institutions that we work for and serve to make the inner like the outer. 
Um, somebody wants to know about some of the statistics we talked about at the top and who the company that gave the most was, and that was JP Morgan Chase. I'll, from my Twitter feed, send you a link to um, some of the statistics I cited. I'm at Stacy Palmer, and I'm happy to help you. Um, and I think we're going to try to squeeze in one more question in the time that we have. Uh, folks want to know whether crowdfunding precipitated a reduction in what donors are giving directly to nonprofits. Anna Marie, you probably are closest to crowdfunding. Do you think that crowdfunding adds to what's being given or takes away from traditional nonprofits? I don't see a relevance. <laughs> I think that the crowdfunding is individuals, and I'm not sure that foundations and boards are looking at what's happening in crowdfunding. I do think that it's critical, the crowdfunding, because, um, for example, to take the Latino community, we're 20% of the population. You would think that uh, the dollars that are going out are proportional, but it's not. We receive only 1% of philanthropic dollars, and that number has changed, stayed the same for 40 years, uh, that 1%. So if it wasn't for individuals and crowdfunding, you know, we wouldn't be doing the things that we're doing. So uh, crowdfunding, I think, is key. And I wanted to add, um, I work on, with Latin, um, with Candid as well. I'm on their board. And there's a really great website called latinxfunders.org. So it's www.latinxfunders.org. And they are tracking the dollars that are going to the community. And mm. right now they have five years. They're about to add two more years. I'm hoping that once we start getting data for 20. 20, 2020, 2021, um, that will be different. And I know they're doing this for the Native American community, for the black community, for racial, um, the racial um, equity work. So that's important to take a look at. Oh, I'm really glad you mentioned that. We could go on all day. Um, thank you panelists for you have all been so wonderful in terms of giving us your time. Daniel, Earl, Anna Marie, um, thank you for the wealth of insights that you had. Um, we appreciate it. Um, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can on social media or other ways from, for some of you in the audience. And I'm sorry that we didn't get to them all. Um, and we will send a recording out to all of you and we'd love your feedback about what we can do on other things. So please feel free to be in touch. Um, and let me thank my partners at The Conversation which really made this event happen. Um, so thank you to them and the Associated Press which has do, been doing tremendous reporting. Um, this is an exciting partnership that allows us to educate the public about about the world of philanthropy, which is often very mysterious. Um, and we really hope to give you all more insights about how it works. So thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day.